Welcome to the St. Louis Regional Freightways Virtual Freight Week STL 2021 and our official kickoff. I'm Mary Lamy, the Executive Vice President of Multimodal Enterprises, a business enterprise of bi-state development. Freight Week STL is in partnership with the Inland Marine Expo hosted in downtown St. Louis. For the next four days, our region, along with shippers and carriers who are attending the in-person Inland Marine Expo, will share their role with forward thinking and innovation that makes the St. Louis region the place of choice for manufacturing and logistics and finding ways that elevate the nation's role in the global market. Today's panel discussion will highlight the global connectivity of the St. Louis region's rail and inland waterway system. And you'll hear firsthand from our industry leaders, the value of the region's rail infrastructure, modal flexibility, innovation with a barge specifically designed to transport containerized cargo and a global perspective of, of the freight market. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, starting with our presenting sponsors, Global Gateway Logistics, Burns McDonald, the Lockmuller Group, Crawford Murphy and Tilly, or CMT, and Castle. Supporting sponsors include the Hauser Group, the Jerry Costello Group, and our associate sponsors include SIBA, SICAP, Washington University, the Boeing Group, CDI Engineering, and Jefferson County Port Authority. Our panelists include Dennis Wilsmeyer, the Executive Director of America Central Port, Neil Langdon, the Executive Vice President of Arcosa Marine Products, and Ron Tyndall, President of the Terminal Railroad Association of St. Louis. Welcome, gentlemen. We'll start with asking each of you to introduce yourself and your organization. Thanks, Mary, and thanks for having me here today. I, I appreciate it. So again, Dennis Wilsmeyer, Executive Director of America Central Port District. We're located in Granite City on the Illinois side of the river. Uh, we are one of 19 public ports in the state of Illinois. We are uh, really just focused on our, our territory uh, of 200 square miles and, and what we work on is about 1200 acres of property. But we're focused on attracting manufacturers uh, and we do that through a lot of investment in our infrastructure rail primarily, but certainly the river harbors uh, and building a new river harbor in 2016. And uh, it is that rail comp component and piece that ties in with that river harbor. And then a great trucking setup and, and network with our 2 million square feet of warehouse space. And it really all works together uh, for the attraction of manufacturers and distributors here to the St. Louis region. Again, thanks for having me today. Thanks, Dennis. Okay, we also have Neil Langdon, the Executive Vice President of Sales at Arcosa Marine Products, whose office is located in Nashville, Tennessee. Neil, can you introduce us to Arcosa and your role with the barge industry? Yes, Mary, thanks for having me here today as well. Um, I head up the sales at Arcosa Marine Products. Uh, we build uh, tank barges, hopper barges, deck barges, and this new container on barge. Uh, we have shipyards in the Nashville, Tennessee area, Carruthersville, Missouri, and Madisonville, Louisiana. Uh, we also uh, make uh, components like fiberglass covers for grain barges, and we also uh, make uh, products for tow boats and barges under the uh, Nabrico trademark name and the Wintech trademark name. Uh, we're a publicly traded company headquartered in Dallas, Texas. And we have uh, several infrastructure related businesses within the, Ar the Arcosa portfolio. Thanks for having me today. Thanks for joining us today. Next is Ron Tyndall, president of the Terminal Road Association of St. Louis. Ron is also the chairman of the Freight Development Committee. Uh, Ron has been with TRA. Ron, has it been almost a year? So Just right over a year. All right, very good. And you previously worked for Trans Global Solutions and spent over 20 years with Union Pacific Railroad. Can you please introduce us to TRR and your role um, with that company? Certainly, uh, just like everybody else, thanks for allowing me to be here. I appreciate the opportunity today. Uh, here at the TRA, we have over 70 internal customers that we serve and we give their products off to our owner groups, which are six class one railroads where we can interchange and uh, have uh, have everything shipped out. We could have it on either coast within a two to three day timeline, Canada, Mexico, New Orleans, other ports. 
and uh, what really makes this area so attractive to business is uh, all the different shipping options that we can help provide along with uh, the ports. Excellent. Thanks, Ron. Okay, so Dennis, we're going to start off with you. Um, last year, America Central Port received a build grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation for rail and barge terminal improvements at three ports in two states. And many of today's viewers include ports, shippers, and carriers, and they're all interested in learning more ways to generate new business and business uh, sustainability. Can you tell us how the improvements included with the grant will enhance efficiency and operations and opportunities for freight movement? Absolutely. Yeah, so great question. Uh, so really, I, I think just a little bit of history on the build grant. So uh, it started with SBF Marine, uh, our operator here at America Central Port. They also operate it at a couple of other river terminal facilities, some on the St. Louis side and, and another one on the Illinois side of the river. Uh, through that whole grant application, uh, really, it, and it's a, it's a huge project, $25 million for upgrading and improvements. Uh, making improvements to those river harbor uh, terminal facilities in order to increase efficiency. Most of that's going to be rail track and rail track investment in terms of, of adding, putting more rail track on the ground, uh, allowing more opportunities to bring in unit trains and to unload those on, on a quicker basis. Um, from really from the standpoint of working together and, and uh, making this happen, and, and I, I guess I just kind of want to, for the, the viewers out there today, um, helping them think about future grant applications and that sustainability and making uh, things a little more efficient. Uh, what really played well here was two sides of the river, uh, two states and three separate counties coming together really to make this grant application work. Uh, the support that, that gets brought together because of that, uh, I think was just key and, and vital, really crucial uh, when Maritime Administration was reviewing this and, and looking through this grant application. They're looking for a lot of collaboration and, and the grants today that are out there are all about collaboration. And so the bigger the area uh, or the more collaboration at least that you can get uh, and, and not look at that one project in a vacuum, but look at the entire system, uh, I think is, is just crucial, uh, crucial and, and vital for that. Uh, and I just really kind of uh, recommend that, that others that are out there looking at this do the same type of thing. Uh, and look at the bigger picture. And that's what this one's doing. So uh, again, it's, it's rail components at Riverport facilities. So again, back to what Ron had said earlier about that sustainability and working together and one feeding another, uh, it, is, it is all about making that, uh, that system work. That's excellent. Because we know when USDOT is reviewing those grant applications, they're looking for multiple state participation, public-private partnerships, and then also uh, inclusion of multiple um, modes, so excellent. Um, okay, Neil, we're gonna talk about containers uh, on barges. We've heard that Arcosa is fabricating barges that are specifically designed for containerized cargo. What can you tell us about the timing and status of this exciting project? Yes, Mary, um, we started this project about a year ago. Uh, our CEO and Arcosa had the foresight to see other investments being made on the river uh, for container ports. And we decided as a company to invest in building two of these specially designed barges to help promote more container movement on the rivers. And so we have now finished the first barge and it's in the water in Madisonville, Louisiana. And the second barge will be finished uh, in, in uh, May. And uh, they are, uh, ready to go to work uh, when we find somebody to use them. So Neil, what did you do to specifically accommodate the containers with this, the design? Yes, um, we, we looked at the current river, um, the, the way the, river, the people work the rivers with barges. And I've been in this business for over 40 years now. And we were excited to try to uh, design and promote something new on the river. So well, we looked at the normal river toes that are typically 200 foot by 35 foot hopper barges. And we designed a barge that's 200 foot by 70 foot. So it would take the same place and space in a, in a tow of 15 to 30 or 40 barges. And we can get more containers in that space with a 200 by 70 foot barge than a 200 
than two 200 by 35 foot barges. So ballpark, how many containers? And I know part of that is dependent on the weight of the containers. Yeah, so, so two barges uh, can carry uh, 144 TEUs or 70 foot con or 20 foot containers, and they can carry 72 40 foot containers in the, in the two separate barges. In our one barge, we can carry 224 TEUs or 20 foot containers or 112 40 foot containers. So that means in the same space of the tow, using our new uh, specially designed barge, you can carry 80 more TEUs or 40 more 40 foot containers in that same space. So that gives, makes it a lot more efficient to uh, move more containers in the same space in, in barge tows. That's great because it's all about scale of economy and it's obvious you're taking advantage of that with that special design. So that's excellent. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Ron, let's talk about rail. Based on tonnage data from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the St. Louis region is ranked as the most efficient inland port system in the nation. And that's thanks in part to our geographic advantage on the Mississippi River and the cost efficiency of the St. Louis region's rail barge connectivity along the river. How significant is barge to rail modal flexibility for the St. Louis region's manufacturing and logistics industries? Well, it's significant in a number of different ways. First and foremost, it gives options. So suppliers can look and say, what's the most efficient? And in many cases, the cheapest way that I can ship my product to my destination. And instead of being landlocked and only having the rail option or only having the port option, having both gives them the flexibility to, uh, to make those decisions that are best for them. And uh, when they do that, they tend to come this direction. So as Dennis says, we're always looking for new business to come into this area. And it's, it's really not to find because there's so many people lining up that want to do business in the St. Louis area for these reasons. That's excellent. Okay, so we talked about how the St. Louis region is the most efficient inland um, port system. We've also been branded as Ag Coast of America, and that's based on the highest capacity to transport agricultural and fertilizer products in the U.S. along the inland waterway system. Is the ag industry a growth opportunity for the St. Louis rail and barge industry? I would say it absolutely is, but much of the ag business is driven by price in certain places around the globe. But what's nice here is by having the option to get on the barge or the railroad, both is uh, suppliers can get to those markets more efficiently and quickly. And it allows them to pivot to the market change uh, being that we're in this location. They're, they're in prime real estate to be able to make changes quickly to uh, maximize their profits. So when you talk about pivot and the ability, you know, to move <clears throat> mode to the other. Um, how important is the infrastructure? What makes us unique, you know, as far as the infrastructure we have in place for each of those modes and allowing shippers and carriers to be able to instantly move from one mode to the other? Well, infrastructure is extremely important. So that's why you can't wait until you have a problem or something breaks down. For example, our Merchants Bridge, we looked at our life expectancy on it and still had a couple of decades before we really had to be worried, but we're going through a major restructuring right now, should be completed by the end of uh, 22. And because you have to have these resources available right away. You can't wait until the business demands that you need them. They've gotta be there and they gotta be ready to take uh, surges and new business when it comes along. All right, excellent. Would you mind just giving us a, a brief lesson in unit train capabilities as far as like, loop tracks and, and the infrastructure that we have in place that allows unit trains to come to the St. Louis market and be able to load and unload uh, products efficiently. So unit trains are not as used as they were uh, prior to precision scheduled railroading, but uh, there is a big advantage in that. And then we can get a lot of tonnage in very quickly and get the cars back out to reduce cycle time so they can get back to where they're loaded, get back to uh, unloading even quicker. So unit trains allow that uh, speed. In many cases, you can unload an entire unit train in less than 24 hours and have it spun back out, headed empty to go reload again. So having those options here is very attractive to shippers. Okay, excellent. Okay, Dennis, let's keep talking about ports. You are a model for success for strategic port growth and infrastructure investment. 
For new startup ports, you and your staff continue to be mentors to emerging ports and le new leaders in the industry. Tell us about America Central Ports timeline for success, focusing on your continued investment in infrastructure that consistently is attracting new freight generating tenants. Great. Uh, so yeah, we, we certainly try with, with new ports. Uh, there's a lot of uphill battle out there for, for small startup ports, trying to get funding in place, just, just operational revenues and that sort of thing. So we do a lot of work with them and, and trying to mentor it and, and bring them along. You mentioned infrastructure investment and, that, and that's key. As, as I mentioned earlier, we spend and invest heavily uh, in, in building new rail track, upgrading our rail track, uh, and then in 2016, built the new Madison Harbor uh, and put that into service on the Mississippi River system. And, it, and for us, it's all about the infrastructure investment because what we found out years and years ago was that, uh, well, first of all, rail tracks are expensive, a harbor's very expensive. And for manufacturers that are looking for a location, they're not ready to or able to invest in that kind of uh, capital outlay in order to get their businesses up and going. So for us, it's just a, a, that constant investment, constant improvement, as, as Ron had said, uh, just kind of putting the money back on in, into use again uh, in, an, in an effort to attract those companies and, and bring them on uh, here. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's tough. It, it's taken us a long time. We've been around for 60 plus years, so it's not something that happens overnight, uh, but it is slow growth. It is uh, continually reinvesting back in the property again and making that uh, attractive for other people to come and take advantage. Dennis, do you have any um, updates regarding new tenants that could result in new rail or barge service or mention your most recent tenants who have come to the port? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So we, we work heavily with uh, Alliance STL um, and Intersect Illinois just in, in fielding prospective companies. And the good news is coming out of COVID, I think we have seen more prospective companies looking at the St. Louis region than I can honestly remember since about 2004, 2005. So I think the prospect and the outlook for St. Louis is very good. Uh, people are starting to realize and understand that there are a lot of markets available here in the St. Louis area to come in and, and uh, take advantage of St. Louis. Specifically on the port here, uh, 2019, fall of 2019, we landed Boise Cascade Lumber Company. Uh, they came in uh, and I think it's, it's really taken advantage of the rail component. And I will tell you through COVID and everybody knows what's happened with lumber prices, call it good timing or good location or a good decision. Uh, but they really skyrocketed through the COVID uh, downturn and, and, and piece of time uh, where they were very thankful that they had rail uh, access and all the storefronts and distribution centers that they were serving, they were able to very adequately at, um, and, and uh, effectively take care of out of this facility here at America Center. Very good. Anything else you want to add regarding COVID? If I have a panel discussion, I, we've got to talk about COVID and its <laughs> impacts to your operations or your tenants or impacting your growth projections. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, I, will, I will tell you, starting in on COVID last year in 2020, uh, really, we didn't see a slowdown until about June or July. And then it was about a month to two months, really, that it slowed down. And then it picked back up again. But, you know, really more from a global perspective, what we're seeing right now, everybody's heard of the Suez Canal issue. It's all those graphic pictures for about a week uh, here, here a month or so ago. Uh, but that's a half a world away. What we have going on yet on, uh, on the coast of LA Long Beach right now with ships being moored off, uh, off harbor, basically out in the ocean, still trying to unload those uh, vessels. Uh, we're seeing today a lot higher consumer prices because the demand is there for those consumer goods. We just can't get them in the distribution system in our country. So I think one of the effects of COVID is going to be a, a relook at, at our entire distribution system and, and transportation system in the country in order to make sure we're getting those goods to where they need to be. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, Neil. What type of commodities do you envision that could be using the um, uh, container on barge system? Uh, uh, we see a wide variety of products actually, and it could be inbound uh, or outbound, you know, for import or export. Um, the, it, it, 
Uh, you could put grain in containers. Um, it can be liquid liquid products in uh, the container in liquid containers. Uh, there's just a wide variety of products that could be moved. You know, basically anything coming to ship it around the world in containers. Uh, you can put it on. You can put them on the on our barge. So thinking out of the box, things that come to mind for me, you know, I guess things that aren't necessarily time dependent um, would be like tires or construction material, um, appliances, anything like that. Yes, it could, could be that could Paddle. be. Yes, could be wood wood flooring. Uh, it could be over overweight containers uh, that could be coming into the port of New Orleans that can't go on the roads and come up river uh, by, by barge. Uh, so there could be some niche markets like that that people could look at uh, to you know make things more efficient. And this would, uh, we're, we're working with our friends on rail and, and truck, you know, this just gives more options. And you know, both, all three modes of transportation are needed many times. And so this just gives, gives options there, uh, especially with the roads uh, being being um, you know very busy these days, uh, and, and getting getting some trucks off the roads, you know could could be an option. Okay, so Neil, as you know, the St. Louis region, we have been partnering with two of the ports in southern Louisiana, Port of New Orleans and the Port of Plaquemines, in efforts to try and support a container on barge or a container on vessel initiative. Do you have any specific service locations? that you are working with shippers to be able to access this new service? Or are you guys still kind of like that startup mode where you're just promoting um, these new barges to any of the markets who may be interested? Yes, we're, we're more in, in the startup mode because uh, our, our barges can go uh, in any place on the river. You know, they can go to Pittsburgh, they can go all the way up to Minneapolis, Chicago, you know, Houston, Mobile. Uh, the, the, they are inland rivers, uh, you know, in, inland river designed, uh, but they could work on the East Coast um, if they're not out in the open ocean. Um, so, you know, they have a variety of places that, that they can be used. Okay, excellent. Okay, Ron, you mentioned the Merchant's Bridge. And as you know, for the St. Louis region and the freightway, uh, the Merchants Bridge is our region's highest um, priority infrastructure project. Uh, it's obviously owned by Terminal Railroad, by your office. It's 130 years old. It's a primary east-west rail corridor. Um, how will the new Merchants Bridge benefit for transportation in terms of, you'd said it's, it's going to be more efficient, but tell us how those improvements are going to make freight movement more efficient. Well, how that translates, whenever you have really solid infrastructure, and, and good quality in the ground as we use in the rail industry. You have uh, less risk, so there's less chance of something really bad happening like a derailment on the bridge because it's a lot hardier, it's stronger, and you have less energies too. So now we may have to take, let's say, uh, eight hours twice a week to go up and maintain the bridge during normal circumstances. Once we get this done, uh, you can eliminate not all of it, but probably 90% of that. So you've just gained capacity because you've eliminated 14 or 15 hours a week. We're used to no trains can move and now we can keep traffic moving. But if you look at that the course of the year, that's really a, a tremendous capacity gains. Okay, so now we're focusing on efficiency and improved capacity. Now let's, let's translate that to freight forwarders. And a freight forwarder is basically a travel agent for cargo to handle their transportation needs. So what influences a freight forwarder when selecting freight transportation corridors? And how does the St. Louis region compete in that market? I can tell you from my perspective in, in dealing with this, what they really boil down to is cost and efficiency as far as what their timeline is. A lot of folks are gonna to wanna to look at, you know, it depends on what is most important for their market. Some markets are willing to pay a little bit more to get something quicker. For others, time is not as uh, important to them, so cost becomes the issue. St. Louis, when you look from an ag market standpoint, is very attractively located for that is in regards to uh, ag products because they're generally not as time sensitive as some other products might be. So cost being a big driver makes St. Louis extremely appealing for those uh, types of options. 
Okay, so that helps us out with freight forwarders. Um, <coughs> without stating the obvious, how do these factors influence um, locations for manufacturing and logistics expansion or for site selectors? How is this important to them? Well, this is not the only thing they would be looking at, but it's a big part of it. You want to reduce shipping time and shipping costs. So if you're closer to your shipper, obviously that's what you're going to do, especially if you can deliver right to the port or right to the rail and cut out the truck as the middleman, you reduce a lot of time and a lot of cost. Uh, they're going to look at other factors. They're going to look at tax rates. They're going to look at what kind of good quality employees they can get in a location. So all those different factors come in, but obviously uh, the shipping and what they can do to get their product out and get their raw products in uh, is a big factor. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Mary, all right. Oh, go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, if I could, I think, and I'd echo what Ron said there, because I, I think it is certainty. Uh, the, those site selectors are looking, they want to make sure that they're putting a company in a location where there's certainty. And, and certainty a lot is the transportation piece of it. And the great thing about St. Louis, uh, we have four navigable rivers. We have six class one railroads. You have the ability, and then the, the incredible interstate system that we have here, uh, again, right in the heart of the country. So you have all of those options, depending on where you locate, but certainly all those options to be able to move your product. And, and that's a big piece of what people are looking at, especially manufacturers uh, are looking at in terms of getting the raw material in and that finished product out is, is that certainty. Very good. Okay, so Ron, with that said, anything else TRRA is doing to take advantage of this, this, these market opportunities? Obviously, you're investing in your system. Is there anything else that you guys are looking at to take advantage of the, the, the market? Yeah, we're currently talking with a few potential customers about development site locations. Uh, we also work with groups like Dennis and his team to see how we can improve uh, the service we give them and help them uh, deliver new, or get new business because in that regard, we both win. So uh, we're trying to find those win-win solutions with our current customers and then looking to expand a little bit uh, on our customer base as well. Excellent. Okay, Dennis, I still wanna talk about container on barge. So do you have any updates to share regarding container on barge services at America Central Port? Yeah, so, so thanks, appreciate that. And, and so Neil's uh, comments were particularly uh, timely and, and helpful. Uh, in fact, I'd love to see one of his barges here, if not more of them. Uh, so SCF Marine uh, began uh, really, so they've been in the business, as, as most people know, on the, on the Mississippi River system at Baton Rouge, uh, Memphis, Baton Rouge to New Orleans piece of things. They have now extended that to the St. Louis market. So they've been operating out of our Madison Harbor here for probably eight, nine months, something like that, uh, biweekly service primarily, but it's moving empty again. And so... Uh, it is that piece of it, and, and as Neil's already talked about, anything, literally anything that can be put in a, a container can be moved uh, on, on river barges. So uh, SCF is doing a great job. It's still in its infancy, uh, and we just need to kind of support and, and help that operation. Very good. And so keeping that in mind, um, can you just tell us at, at that phase where you're at, what type of equipment or infrastructure do you need in place? Because obviously we have a lot of other ports listening to this and the interest is, can I just start this type of operation now? What type of equipment do you need in order to, to be successful and to, to reach out to Neil and, and find out if these are options? Yeah, great. Uh, so, you know, we were fortunate in 2016, we finished the Madison Harbor, which put a sheet pile wall, general cargo dock, uh, right on the Mississippi River system there, uh, just north of St. Louis. So great location, uh, just below Locks 27. So those familiar with the, the river system know that we have free flowing river from that point all the way down to New Orleans. So great location. Uh, it's out of the, the, the immediate downtown area, just north of there. So it's out of the congestion, um, but, but really good uh, location from that standpoint. Um, we did apply for and receive a, an American Marine Highway grant through Maritime Administration. Uh, so to the equipment uh, question that you had, Mary, so we will be getting a crane uh, to help unload and, and load those containers, uh, some cameras put in uh, in order to secure the area. And then we're also looking at a container tilter in order that will actually tilt these containers up and we'll be able to put product into them, primarily uh, bulk, dry bulk product uh, into those containers to fill them and hopefully start moving some full containers down the river. Very good. Okay, Neil, seems like my questions for you and Dennis regarding container on barge are pretty darn similar. 
How is your company working with ports like America Central Port um, or other terminal operators? What else can we do that we get your two entities working together to try and, and support these efforts? I, I think that goes uh, back to the freight forwarders and getting more people knowledgeable about the opportunities to move containers on the river. Um, I think a lot of people don't know that yet. And we're, we've been uh, running some ads in some logistics magazines to try to spread the word that you can move containers on the river, you know, whether it's our barges or, or other, you know, standard hopper barges that people are already using. So I think getting the word out and, you know, doing things like, like, like today's uh, presentation uh, helps with that. Um, and knowing that, you know, St. Louis and the Midwest are really the breadbasket to the world in many ways, you know, this would just, um, you know, piggyback on top of all the good infrastructure that's already in the Midwest, you know, to get our products to the world or get world's products to the, to the Midwest of the United States. Very good. And you are attending the Inland Marine Expo that is in person this week. And I would imagine that's also another opportunity for you to meet with um, industry leaders to talk about um, the special design for the barge. Yeah, yeah, yes, very much so. We, we, we do have a booth there this year. And we're excited to be doing a live and in-person mm -hmm. uh, show this year. And we, we thank Spence and his uh, group at the Waterways Journal to, you know, help help promote that and bring bring all these industries together because uh, that, that helps us all, uh, you know, get more business and make the world a better place. Very good. Okay, thanks. Okay, Ron, here's your last hard question, okay? So we can't have a panel discussion about freight not talk about the impact of COVID on the rail industry. Um, any comments, thoughts regarding um, impacts of COVID to the St. Louis region or around the nation over the past year? I would echo what Dennis said. We saw the same uh, same time period. We saw drop, drop off in traffic. It's come back and uh, now it's back gangbusters. The, uh, the issue that COVID has caused that we're gonna have moving forward is we're gonna have hiccups in the supply chain. And for example, lumber right now, uh, it's extremely expensive. And the reason is they can't get it cut at the mills quick enough to get it on cars or to get it on barges to get it where it needs to go. And that last I read, there's an 18 to 24 month backup in, in that industry. We're seeing that in a lot of industries. So we're going to continue to see hiccups, I would say, for the next 18 to 24 months, just with logistics. So that's where COVID has made a great impact. Or not great in a good way, but very powerful right. impact for us. Now, here locally for us, uh, we still have to keep working every day. We have to keep our people safe. We didn't start to have issues with a lot of employees' infections until October, November. And we've already pushed through that. And everyone's COVID-free. Everyone's working. They're getting their vaccinations. And uh, right now, we're just trying to handle the business coming at us and doing a pretty good job of doing it. All right. Very good. Okay, you guys. Um, I think at this point, I'm just going to go around and have you give any final comments or words of wisdom. And we're going to start with Dennis, go to Neil, and then Ron. So, Dennis, um, anything we haven't touched on that our viewers should know or any final comments? Yeah, I, I, I don't know that we didn't touch on it, but certainly the, I, I think that my key takeaways today are collaboration and infrastructure development. And I think that's one thing the St. Louis Regional Freightway has done a great job of, and, and you, Mary, should be applauded and, and the entire team there, but uh, really highlighting the need for infrastructure investment. And I think even at the national level now, you're starting to see all this money flow forth uh, under the Biden administration now for uh, you know, investing in that infrastructure nationwide. And I think that's something that St. Louis has been working on long before. Uh, the administration change, in fact, for the last six to seven years or so, I've uh, been pushing that forward. The collaboration piece is key. And so working together here with two states, multiple counties, uh, just it's, it's fantastic in order to be able to push that uh, those projects forward, to be able to work with federal legislators on both sides of the river and to make those projects happen. And uh, again, really appreciate being here today. Excellent, Dennis. Thank you. Um, great comments. Neil, you're up. Anything else we haven't touched on that our viewers um, should know or any final comments? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, uh, thanks for having me today. And uh, a couple other things that we've um, 
been innovative in the past year or two uh, outside of our normal. Uh, one, one of the additional things on our barges, uh, we've developed some uh, telemetry that has GMS coordinates of where the barges are and can show the list and trim and some uh, we're, we've, we've done that in conjunction with uh, Timco and their Barge Plus telemetry things. And so we're looking, really looking at ways to be more innovative on, on the river for the barges and tow boats. Um, so that way they can work more collaboratively with the rail. Um, if, if the information is there and it's easier to work with other modes of transportation, you know, know that what's coming up and down the river you know, when it's going to get to the port so the ports can be more active and more efficient and that just helps every, everything flow smoother um, and, and 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 I would second the um, turmoil in the supply chain uh, in many industries right now and I, I, I echo that it's going to be uh, 12 to eight, 12 to 24 months before a lot of that straightens out uh, with the with the covid and, and all the um, issues with that, you know, and uh, our, our company, uh, overall company, we're very uh, infrastructure related. Uh, we have aggregate companies. We build uh, um, other uh, infrastructure towers, um, electrical towers. Um, so we're, we're very much in the infrastructure uh, business overall. So, uh, you know, I think like we've got a lot of bright things in the future coming up in the next few years. Thanks for having me today. Excellent comments. Thanks for your time today. Ron Tyndall, any final comments you'd like to share? Yes, I would. Again, thanks for having me here today, but I really want to hit home the point with infrastructure that sometimes we forget. We think we can do something pretty quickly when we see the need for it. We try to approach it from what's our 20-year plan, then what's our 10-year plan, and work backwards from there. So that allows us to come up with our day-to-day -day activities and our weekly activities that support the long-term plan. So you've really got it when it comes to infrastructure, especially the amount of money we have to spend to maintain our railroads and the ports and our highways, we've really got to have some long-term planning and aggressive activities to get there. Because if you don't plan it, it's not going to happen. Fantastic. Thanks again for your time. All right, you guys, Dennis, Neil, and Ron, thanks for your time today and sharing your role with infrastructure investment support of new options to transport freight and the market growth. The St. Louis region has the geographic advantages of being located in the center of the U.S., most strategic location on the Mississippi River and the crossroads of Class 1 railroads. But that doesn't always guarantee a supply chain or a logistics network will continue to be successful. The secret to success is what we heard today. Someone needs to invest in the infrastructure, like the Merchant's Bridge, or with improvements that include the BUILD grant for three ports in two states. Someone needs to take risks, someone needs to try new routes, and try new ways of transporting freight, and a barge designed to specifically carry containerized cargo does just that. And someone needs to value multimodal operations that help shippers with modal flexibility, and thanks to Dennis, Neil, and Ron, the nation's logistics cluster continues to grow, attracting carriers from different modes of transportation and different service levels. So many thanks to the three of you for taking time out of your schedule and being part of this discussion. So last thing we need to do is thank our sponsors. We have a panel discussion scheduled each day of Freight Week STL, along with the release of the 2022 Freightway Priority Project list on Thursday, and the Industrial Real Estate Market Report will be released on Friday. We encourage all of you to share this information from our Freight Week STL social media platforms and press releases and visit our website at thefreightway.com.